Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of Cycling Research Review, Interview Edition. And today, once again, we are in Helsinki at the Nectar 2019 conference. And with me here, we have Milos uh, from Alto University. Um, so I have a few questions for you today and let's start off with your latest work. And I want to ask what, what inspired you to write your paper, uh, Decision Support Framework for Cycling Investment Prioritization. Did I get it right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh... So, I, I mean, I'm going to be sort of a blank uh, forward. I think we have to recognize that uh, scientific work is filled with values. Yeah. Yeah? Um, and I value cycling a lot. So I wanted to do some research on cycling. And this is how this uh, came to be sort of inspired uh, uh, from, the, from the beginning. Um, of course, um, this motivation of mine was so, sort of it, it got the perfect timing together with a, a colleague of mine uh, from University of Belgrade uh, who was kind of uh, thinking about having a project of, on this on this topic so kind of yeah no this, this was a per perfect window of opportunity to do some uh, do some research on, on this topic so uh, so the basic idea was that um, if you think about uh, sort of professionalizing uh, cycling planning mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, overall um, we have uh, a lot of tools that might exist uh, within specific municipalities, ad hoc tools, a lot of them are just sort of ad hoc, uh, depending on kind of the, the motivation of the particular planner in the city. Um, but not a lot of them are actually being sort of put up on a, on a sort of open access level for everyone. Um, and also uh, kind of the academic community is also doing a lot. Yeah? yeah. So if you think about decision support systems overall, this has been a thing for, uh, you know, transport engineering for decades now. Uh, but if you put decision support system and you put cycling, you'll get like five references yeah? oh, or nice. like three, yeah, yeah? Uh, a single digit number one way or another. So, um, I mean, we have been really good in planning for a specific type of mode, uh, as we all know, and then kind of gradually moved into, into now, of course, transit and other kinds of things. But I think cycling is still uh, sort of largely under-researched, comparatively speaking, yeah, un under-researched area uh, in, our, in our domain. That was sort of the one side of the story. Yeah? But the other side of the story, I think, comes much more uh, to, the, to the question of how do I position myself as a researcher, um, which is, I, I mean, I like reading you know, scientific things and so yeah. on, but I think we really need to be able to engage with practice, mm -hmm. yeah, with practitioners. Uh, and sort of, uh, and when, I, when I say engage, I don't mean like I write a paper and then I send it to them at the end of the day. Yeah? Yeah. So this work was done together with uh, practitioners. They were involved in the workshops. They were involved in the whole process of thinking about the methodology of the whole framework. And they were sort of, the, 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 the knowledge was kind of co-developed together with the practitioners. And then it kind of just, you know, it stayed in, in their organization now. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's not that I want to keep this my knowledge for myself, but the whole point is that this knowledge become, in a sense, institutionalized yeah. now somewhere. Yeah, and then of course that organization can later on teach some other organizations, and so on and so on. Yeah, this can sort of uh, spread spread further. So would you say part of the purpose of this paper is to get practitioners to act in a way, It's to give them a platform uh, to understand what they're doing? And though the most important part is action and then putting this into practice. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, philosophically speaking, knowledge is all about, uh, planning, sorry, is all yeah. about knowledge to action. Yeah. Uh, but in, sort of in a pragmatic manner, uh, I think what I've seen a lot is not, uh, we, we oftentimes have this attitude that sort of the, the planners, the hypothetical planners, whoever uh, those people are, might be in our mind are sort of not doing a good job. They're still planning for cars. And you know, this is kind of like, this is a never ending rant from the academic side. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's like that always. I think we have a lot of planners who want to plan their cities in a different way, but I don't think the tools are there. Yeah? Yeah. If you think about the basic thing, like how traffic forecasting is interlocked with cost benefit analysis, and this is in a sense an institution in itself that is really difficult to break down and move away from because if you would move away from that you would be left with almost no tools whatsoever to kind of deal with what is the other challenge of planning which is uh, the, the process of legitimacy yeah they have to legitimize their own solutions or their own proposals to someone 
oftentimes who has no clue in political system of what do these numbers mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have to give them a map uh, with you know green and uh, you know, red lines on a map and tell them, look, cars. You know, if we plan for cars, that's going to be bad. If we do plan for transit and cycling and walking. It's going to be better. Yeah. Yeah. That's the sort of the, the level of argument they have to present to decision makers. So on one side, I have seen. I mean, I've seen it a lot, uh, especially also in the health security region. We have a lot of planners who are really kind of, you know, they're thinking about sustainability, they're thinking about well-being, health, you know, how do we tackle climate crisis and everything else. But they, I mean, they're kind of, they're playing with the existing tools that they have. So, so I think we still have to use this window or, of action of trying to help them develop, co-develop these tools with them and trying to help them sort of grow the new, the new institution of planning mm-hmm. uh, together. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, this particular paper is on the topic of cycling, but you write uh, about all sorts of different uh, transportation issues. I, I know you, for example, the first time we met, you were talking about ethics of uh, automated vehicles, for example. Could you uh, tell us a bit uh, about uh, the diversity of all the work that you do? <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, so I, I, I'm really hoping my dean is not going to watch this. Uh, so dean <laughs> watching YouTube. Yeah, so, so they, 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 I mean, of course, the, the, the essential, and we can talk about this later, yeah. the essential academic requirement is specialized, specialized, specialized. Yeah, yeah, that's how you get citations. That's how you get sort of your name attached to one keyword. Yeah. Um, I am not that kind of a person. Mm-hmm. I have really, really big struggle to sort of fit into this kind of a box. Um, so to be honest, the reason why I'm studying mobility and transportation is because, uh, I mean, this gives me a chance to just study everything, yeah. yeah, like studying like philosophy, sociology, psychology, but also physics, you know, algorithms, mathematics, yeah. complex networks, whatever, yeah, uh, whatever comes to my mind, it sort of has something to do with. The only thing is that I don't really like is chemistry, so <laughs> uh, some trauma from high school, yeah, 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 and so on. But otherwise, I mean, this is kind of the thing, yeah. So um, so I started with. Um, Gradually, kind of. I mean, I've learned a lot before in traffic management sort of sorts of things. Then I gradually, from there, expanded into general sort of modeling of things and and, and, and transport systems planning, and now sort of transit planning. And um, now we are even t- dealing with integrated planning sorts of issues. But then I, I also dabble in policy and governance. Uh, we have been recently studying also planning processes from more, more kind of a, a kind of organizational knowledge uh, theory and so on. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's um, there is probably a lot of other things that I've uh, uh, I've done and I'm planning to do actually even more. Uh, so I've just sort of, uh, yeah, I think the the it's it's an open field. It's an let's, open field for the Let's world. say like that. Yeah. Um, but speaking of this, um, so like, the the other thing that it, the, you you mentioned about the the, the self driving vehicles and the whole ethics thing. So that's the whole, whole that buzz I, too. There's yeah. so much buzz around it. Yeah, days, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I started working on this, these things, let's say, 2010 issues. Mm-hmm. So this was sort of before the hype uh, the, uh, overall. Um, and back then I was just trying to figure out how to, how to sort of, this, there's this uh, sort of value sensitive design idea. And one of the values that I was thinking about uh, was kind of cooperation while the other one was, you know, human cooperation and the other one was social justice. Yeah. So how do we design Technologies like self-driving vehicles for for sort of these kinds of values. Yeah, so I started with designing the traffic control algorithms uh, for self-driving vehicles back then. Yeah, now I'm. I mean, we're still doing some of that work, uh, more more for the sake of disrupting the current way of thinking <laughs> yeah, yeah. into that into that in in, in that domain. Um, but this has really allowed me so playing with a self-driving vehicle as an artifact in itself as a, so, something that is kind of quite interesting and powerful artifact th- at the end of the day. It has allowed me to learn a lot about um, philosophy of technology on one side and then also political philosophy on the other side. And on top of that, some other things like, you know, psychology, sociology and whatnot. So it was more of a, of a kind of a learning, um, learning um, tool, let's say, uh, o- over the years. So now I'm one of the rare people who is actually trying to raise this, not just on an ethical question like we usually discuss these kind of trolley problems or whatever, like that kind of a narrow definition of ethics. Um, but to bring it about more as a moral question, the basic question is, do we even need self-driving vehicles at all? I think this is an ultimate moral question that 
I, as an engineer, have to ask myself. Yeah, it's not just how should we make this technology, when should it be sort of available, but do we need it? I mean, is this the thing that we desperately need in 2019 to address a lot of other uh, questions that we should be addressing yeah. at the end of the day? Yeah. Um, so what I'm usually kind of in the back of my mind, and I still have to kind of put this down somewhere. I'm playing with this thought of the lure of technology. The lure, yeah? okay. The lure, yeah. Like a fishing Which means book, yeah. um, sort of the technology has a, this kind of a, attraction. It has power over a certain uh, domain of ourselves. Uh, we are ultimately as human beings, we are technological beings. Mm -hmm. uh, we have... Uh, sort of relied on technology to cope with the nature and so on. But we have largely failed to be uh, in, in a kind of reflective yeah. in, a, in our relationship with technology. Um, if you usually ask, I mean, this is my favorite question to my engineering students, uh, what is technology? And then they're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, kid by lighting. But yeah. after a while, if we sort of have this a little bit of reflection process, they move beyond you, the usual preconceptions. Yeah that this is applied science, or this is used for sort of uh, addressing our problems, and so on and so on, and kind of, um, we start seeing that there is a much deeper set of questions or kind of premises behind technology, that it really frames us, who we are, it defines who we are as human beings. Um, so we, we, do, we do put some kind of values in it. It's not value free, so it's not neutral. It has very often um, consequences that we didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. We kind of always paint it as a rosy thing. It's uh, it's this kind of a classical. Uh, there is a Promethean myth yeah, yeah. to it. Yeah. So the uh, the being basically uh, sort of uh, the the Prometheus stole the fire and gave it to the to the to the people, and now sort of the fire is the power, and it will liberate us from the gods and from the nature and so on. So it's sort of a powerful liberating device. But yeah. we kind of all know that it's it's usually a double-edged sword. Yeah. Like the things that surround us, they shape us, and sometimes. In negative ways yeah and kind of they they bring about negative uh, negative consequences but and then sort of the lure part is this uh, innate obsession to start sort of tinkering with the device as soon as you sort of have it at your hands and not being able to just sort of let it go or like just put it down let it go for a while like move, move away your gaze off the device yeah and just ponder the life a little bit like why am i doing this like do i need to be doing this thing as opposed to this sort of like um, distraction. Does that relate to the idea of progress, uh, do you think? Yeah, and I think that it is that uh, especially there, yeah. sort of embedded in this kind of, of course, also the progress of time and how we perceive time in, in, the, in the Western uh, sort of civilization as a linear thing and kind of the progress is something that is usually means also kind of more technology to yeah. it and so on and so on. Yeah, so I think it's, 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 there is a, a big set of issues that it's fascinating on the other side, the people who are responsible for developing technologies mm -hmm. are oftentimes not taught or even encouraged to just think about these things. Yeah. Yeah? It's sort of like, no, the technology is just about the device, design it. It's more, the other day when I was presenting this sort of, I was of course raising the question of what is to be a human together with, with the technology. And then sort of one of the people from the audience says, well, technology is all about minimizing human effort. Huh. And I'm like, um, sure, maybe one among many, many things in some cases. But I mean, is this the purpose of human life? Yeah. Yeah. And then we to get into this sort of discussion zero about effort. meaning. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what is the meaning of all of these, um, the deeper meaning behind all of these things? Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I mean, am I just sort of uh, inclined to uh, be thinking about these non-engineering questions? Mm -hmm. I just think that this is some, something that the 21st century engineers should be thinking about. Yeah. yeah. And then sort of also uh, kind of rethink what is to be an engineer. Uh, so we played, we had a summer school before Nectar. Yeah. Tell and us a bit about that uh, yeah. Nectar summer school and how it went. Uh, so, so we have a summer school that we're organizing every year. This, this was the 13th time we were running it. And basically this, it's usually in August. Mm -hmm. And this year we decided to put it before Nectar. So kind of have a, have a bit of prelude uh, event. Uh, to Nectar because some people will be already coming uh, before and so on and then you, it, it's basically sort of set of lectures and then in this case in this edition we also made a case about a, a part of a sort of a boulevard uh, city in, in Helsinki so city of Helsinki is planning to kind of 
um, remove some of these uh, city or city motorways, yeah. parts of parts of those, and rebuild the city around around the concept of a of a boulevard uh, of a sort. So we're playing with that area, and and what we have been discussing with the students is um, the process of imagineering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, Disney is going to sue me now because I've used the word. Apparently, they copyrighted the, the YouTube yeah. algorithm to yeah. pick yeah. it up. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and then, uh, but but basically, when we, we came up with it, and then we googled it, and we realized that it was copyrighted. But anyway, yeah. the process it was sort of the, the, the discussion was between what is engineering, and then what is imagination. Yeah, because it, 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 engineering is oftentimes about tangible, kind of deliverable, functional devices. Yeah, mm. it's having your feet firm on the ground. That's the classical yeah. sort of misconception, maybe. Um, while imagination is a process, it's a mental state that sort of lasts over, over time as a process of speculative thinking. Yeah? It requires you to be thinking about uh, the desirable very often, mm-hmm. but not necessarily about feasible. It's, not, it's, it's supposed to be a liberating mental state about thinking about 100 infeasible options yeah. to be able to, com- to come to 101st feasible but still creative option. Yeah? Hmm. So it's keeping your head in the clouds. So this was the, so imagineering was how do you keep your head in the clouds and be able to dream yeah. and sort of uh, think think a bit broadly and like you know imagine different futures while still keeping your feet firm on the ground. Yeah? So that's what 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 uh, we kind of had as uh, as the beginning premise of the school. And you wouldn't believe it if you set it up like this. The human mind just takes over, yeah. So all these all these participants from different different places around the world, they just you know it just clicked. There was no like we didn't give them a structured method, you know, yeah. matrices, you know, equations, whatever to deal with. They were just you know dream, think, but first dream, then think about feasibility. Don't start with feasibility and then limit yourself. So they were allowed to dream. So these, yeah. these were a group of academics, right? Young academics. And you yeah. put them into a, uh, a, like a consulting role almost. Yeah, what, almost. what are your like, reflection on, on that? Were they able to, uh, I guess, perform uh, satisfactorily to, towards the, the system uh, in terms of having ideas that could reasonably be implemented? Or were you going for complete, something completely other than that uh, in this mm-hmm. summer school? Yeah, so, so, so what, what we got was uh, nine different groups mm-hmm. with three to four people. Um, so we allowed them to diverge. That was yeah. the whole idea, not forcing them to kind of come to, to one, one solution, uh, but allowing that personalities of these different people emerge at the end of the day of how do they think about knowledge ultimately, mm-hmm. How do they think about the reality of the human experience, the values that should be in the built environment? How do they think about the connection between the process and the outcome? And we got nine different solutions, yeah. Yeah? Uh, and, and sort of not just solutions, but also different processes of how they did these things. Um, and basically, there, there, were a lot, there were a lot of things in common. For example, they all valued nature a lot because we also had part of the our own process was walking around um, the area where uh, where we were over there, and I was trying to kind of uh, ask them to also be perceptive, perceptive about their environment, not just observe with their eyes, but also with their ears and maybe with their skin, oh. and other kinds of things. So they notice the wind, they notice the sort of the bird song in the in, in, in the in the in the nature, and so on. So a lot of them agree that nature is very important, and they really built various solutions around how to incorporate nature into their built environment. Yeah. Protect the existing nature, but even expand. Yeah? Um, and, but you could see that through that process of thinking, they were still coming to the questions of, okay, is this type of a tree feasible yeah? to actually have in a city? And then you, you could, but these, these the feasibility things, you can still Google. Yeah, you can yeah. like, you can, that's, the, that's the part of the machine. The machine can tell you nowadays if this you know, bearing load can handle something or not yeah we can do these kinds of things but imagination is still a human thing mm-hmm. and it should be a starting point and they all kind of saw the, the really really the point in kind of liberating themselves to think in this way and it was also interesting to see how they also um, understood that the world is much more complex than we usually presented that they they can't think about this as just you know the street or the land use but they have to think about so many other things, 
of course the nature as i already said but really also so, so values mm -hmm. what kind of values they want to have over there so the sense of place the sense of a community the sense of being welcome somewhere uh, even the sense of social justice as part of it uh, the positive experiences and various other kinds of things yeah so I think they did a really, really good job. Nice. So you're training really uh, interdisciplinary scholars in, in a way, right? You're preparing them for these complex issues mm -hmm. and to try and step out of their, uh, their single lens, which most of them come from. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that um, this is sort of a... Um, I mean, to me, this is a natural way of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the challenge is that our, our silos are already there. Like, you know, we all we usually have even in the, in the primary school, you start with like, this is a biology class and yeah. this is a you know, physics class. How about the connections between the two? Don't think about no, the no. connections. It's physics teacher, yeah. biology teacher, um, art teacher. Yeah. Exactly. And, I, and, and for me, it's actually very difficult to think in, in silos. Mm -hmm. Like I think in networks, I think in connections and I don't I don't see silos. I, I, I mean. It's kind of a natural way of thinking uh, for me. But then the problem, uh, the underlying problem is the language. Yeah? So the disciplines are still using their languages. It's like, what, how many languages do you speak? It's not anymore like I speak German or French or whatever, but I speak architecture, mm. I speak geography, I speak sociology, I speak philosophy, I speak whatever, computer science and I so on. I speak economics. Yeah? economics. That was a tough transition. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of language do you speak? And, and as part of this is, of course, learning how to bring these people at the table who speak dif already maybe speak different languages but also how to invent like imagineering like yeah. you know how to introduce new words that will help them reconceptualize things yeah. so for example when i teach i'm trying to teach them basics of kind of transport systems dynamics yeah of how things move around the city and there is a, of course a limited capacity to our city just like the land use is limited the transport network is also limited Often, often a preconception of many people uh, come from kind of ICT into transport. Yeah, so I would, I would, I could very easily call this traffic flow theory. Yeah, and people would be like, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. but if I call it system dynamics, mm -hmm. we can so, sort of all agree. Okay, this is about dynamics in a, some kind of a system. Yeah, do, do I have to really use a specific kind of a niche term that will identify me or validate me as kind of like? He is definitely an expert. He yeah, used yeah. the keyword, yeah, like sort of a thing, yeah. I, as opposed to them learning on a kind of upper level uh, that this is the same kind of a thing that exists in another field, which is just called differently. So yeah. let's sort of all agree. It's like Esperanto, yeah, in yeah. a sense of, World of language. science, yeah. Huh. Well, uh, so where can they find you on the internet, Milos? No, I, I, I'm in the middle of the forest. No, I don't <laughs> exist. It's, uh, you know, I'm in a, in a shack. You have to walk yeah, uh, yeah. 20 miles through the snow. Uh, I'm pretty sure if, if, you, if you Google M-I-L-O-S, yeah. Alto, so double A, L-T-O, uh, you will find me. Awesome. Uh, so we, we definitely have this transparency uh, principle in Finland, so I'm pretty much visible. And you do try to pub publish open access, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. definitely. Great. So I'll throw the links on below uh, to him on Twitter, right? You're on Twitter mm -hmm. uh, and to his latest publications and to the cycling publication that we mentioned. Uh, this was a mm -hmm. conversation about cycling, but clearly it went elsewhere, which is we fine because away. everything <laughs> recycled away here. Everything's connected. Uh, so once again, I want to thank you, Miles, yeah. thank and you, uh, stay tuned for the next episode.